This is an edited recording of a talk I gave at Regis University. If you would like to support Nantucket eBooks, please consider becoming a patron on Patreon. So, uh, I'm very glad to be here today. Uh, my name is Nicholas Bernhardt, and today I'm going to talk a little bit about what's involved in hosting your own website. I am the creator of Nantucket eBooks, which is a platform that makes it easier for writers to create and share really great eBooks. And it's uh, something that I host on my own computer. So I'd like to talk a little bit about why you would host something on your own and what's involved in that. And some of the obstacles that you might encounter. So the first thing uh, we might want to talk about is just the idea of servers and clients and IP addresses as well. Basically, the way that the web works is that you have servers that have information on them, and then you'll have clients, which could be your computer or your smartphone or even your watch, and those make a request to the server for information. At its most basic level, that could be the index of a website and the server will serve that information back to the client. They'll send the HTML file, and then that's rendered by the client's browser. Servers can talk to each other, and clients can also upload information to the server. It can be a two-way exchange of information. But that's essentially the server-client model. The second thing I wanted to talk about was IP addresses. The IP address is a set of numbers that identify a particular computer. It helps computers find each other over the internet. So for example, if you were to type in 142.250.75.228 into your browser, that would be one of the many IP addresses for Google. But it's quite unwieldy for someone to have to remember all those IP addresses. So for that we have domain names, which are human readable strings that you can type in and with the infrastructure of the internet, there's something called the domain name system, which uh, associates a particular domain name with a particular IP address. So servers, clients, IP addresses. Those are all going to be important things when thinking about hosting your own site. I guess the first question to begin with is why go through all the trouble? There are a great number of platforms that will host a website for you, why go through the trouble of hosting your own website? Uh, the most basic level, I guess, would be curiosity. Uh, when I was starting Nantucket eBooks, I wanted to try out a lot of different things. I wanted to create a new way of thinking about eBooks. And so to give myself the maximum room to experiment, I wanted to have my own server to try different things out on. I have a personal website that's hosted by a friend from back in college. And if I want to do anything to that server, like if I wanted to install Git or change the password, I have to ask him and he has to update it. I wanted something that was under my control that I could change. Uh, another part of this is that if you, when you go through the process of hosting your own server, you learn a lot and you'll gain experience that a lot of people in web development don't have. So even if you, in your career, aren't going to be hosting your own platform, I think this will give you a lot of insight into what's involved and what's going on behind the scenes, so to speak. Uh, the second reason is accountability. Uh, since I was creating an ebook platform and I was going to be hosting a lot of different books, I wanted to be able to say that what was on the site was on me and that I had you know, the final responsibility for what was published on the site. Now the thing with this accountability, it is a double-edged sword because you are responsible for what's on that server. If you have any of your users' personal information, uh, you're going to be responsible for the security and the integrity of that information. So making sure that passwords don't get compromised, uh, making sure that if there was a power outage, um, how do you get it back online so that there's not a big outage for your customer base. The final reason is that I think that uh, decentralized web is an important goal to have. Um, more and more, web hosting is done by a select number of companies. Uh, Amazon Web Services 
is a good example. They control a hu huge number of websites. The problem with that is if Amazon has a problem, then a lot of the internet has a problem. You know, if you hear that Amazon Web Services is down, there's a good chance that a site that you use quite frequently is also going to be down. On a practical level, that's a real problem to have so much of the internet concentrated at such a specific failure point. But on a more general level, it's a problem to have that much decision-making authority concentrated so narrowly. So the more that people can be hosting their own websites, uh, I think that flattens it out. It sort of democratizes it. That if one part of it fails, the rest of it doesn't necessarily fail. So the more we can move toward a decentralized web, I think that is a really good goal. So with that in mind, I can tell you a little bit about the process of starting your own self-hosted website. The first thing you're going to need is some equipment. You're going to need a computer to use as a server. Uh, you'll need a router that's connected to your internet service provider. You're going to need a surge protector slash battery backup because you need to protect the information on your server. You're going to need an ethernet cable to connect your server to your router. And you could optionally get a monitor and a keyboard to set up your server. So for my own site, I use a Raspberry Pi, which is a really small, inexpensive computer. Really great because it's meant to be used in server environments. I would not recommend laptops. Servers are meant to be on 24-7, 365 days a year. Laptops generally can't take that amount of strain. Then you're going to connect server to the router so you can access the internet. Then you'll want to install Apache on your server. If you're on uh, Linux, which uh, is what the Raspberry Pi runs, you can install Apache. AMPS is a good one for Windows because that is a way of combining your Apache server with uh, your database, like MySQL, it'll use PHP and all that. Then you're going to access your router's gateway. Generally, there will be an IP address on the bottom of or the side of your router where um, if you type in that address, it'll bring you to this page. So, for example, in this one, the IP address would be 10.0.0.1, and then that you log in, uh, and usually this is pretty insecure default information, which you will want to change if you're running a server on your local internet. Anyway, you'll get into your router's gateway, and once you're in your gateway, you're going to set up port forwarding. Ports you can think of as channels associated with a different way of communicating. You, you need to open up different ports if you want people to be able to access your server in different ways. When it comes to port forwarding, you'll want to open up uh, 80 and 8080 for HTTP. And you'll want to open up 443 for HTTPS, and then uh, for a matter of convenience, you'd open up port 22 for SSH if you want to log in via the command line to your server. Now you have to be very careful, I can't stress this enough, with port forwarding. Every port that you open up on your server is another way that people can get into your server. So the more ports you open up, the more exposed, in a very literal sense, uh, your server is. A lot of cybersecurity people would actually tell you to not open up port 22 because anyone can try to log in to your server that way. So a hacker could just be spamming away trying different login passwords to get into your computer that way. But it is a convenient way of uh, updating your site remotely. So that's generally why some people open it. And the instructions for doing port forwarding are going to be different based on what router model you have and what internet service provider you're using. The next thing is you're going to want to call up your internet service provider and purchase a static IP address. So most uh, IP addresses are temporary. They're assigned to the computers on your network by the ISP and then they switch out at regular intervals like every 90 days or if you restart a computer or if there's an outage and your computer restarts the, uh, the IP address will change. So you want to purchase a very specific IP address for your server. But once you have your static IP, you can purchase a domain name and point it at a server. There's a lot of sites where you can purchase domain names. 
Uh, one I've always used is Network Solutions. I think they have pretty good customer service. There's also GoDaddy. And a uh, domain name can cost anywhere from maybe $15 a year to tens of thousands of dollars a year. The thing to watch out for with domain name providers is that they'll try to upsell you on everything. They'll try to sell you a bunch of things you don't need. The one extra service that they'll try to sell you, which is really worth it, is privacy protection. By law, every domain name has to have contact information. With privacy protection, you can use a proxy building that is owned by the, that's associated with the domain name provider. Next thing you want to do is set up SSL or HTTPS to work with your server. This is just making sure that the communication between your client and your server is all encrypted. Now there's a site called Let's Encrypt that a lot of people use and I think is pretty good. And they have all the documentation for how to set up the certificate on your server. Once you have your certificate set up on your site, which you can test by putting HTTPS at the beginning of your domain name, you're going to want to force all traffic through HTTPS. And you do that by creating a file on your server called htaccess and put in forwarding instructions. And there's lots of documentation online about how to do that. And when you have that, anyone who tries to go to your site through HTTP, it'll get redirected to the secure method. It's worth talking a little bit about why you should use HTTPS. I think everyone would understand if you're taking people's personal information, if you're processing online payments, then obviously you want that to be encrypted. Another reason is that Google will lower your search ranking if your site does not have HTTPS. They factor that into building their rankings and they'll rank you lower if you're not secure. So it's very important for your search engine optimization. You might be thinking, you know, I'm just making a static website. I'm not taking anyone's credit card information, I'm not saving any passwords. It's pure HTML and CSS. Do I need HTTPS for that? I would still say yes. And the reason for that is something called the man in the middle. If that communication method is unencrypted, then anyone can not only listen in if they're on the network and see that communication, they can inject their own content. They can inject their own HTML, they can inject their own JavaScript, they could ping a different server and collect personal information from you. As an example, a lot of hotels, if you're connecting through HTTP to some website, that'll go through the hotel's router and they have code that'll inject advertising into whatever page you're looking at. Uh, the same goes with the Wi-Fi on airplanes or basically any public Wi-Fi. There's the risk of someone spying on that communication. You want the only parties to be the client and the server. You don't want any third party involved in that. So even if you have a static site, you need HTTPS. The last thing in our step-by-step -step for this is how you would upload to your server. You can obviously upload through SSH. You could also get a graphical FTP client. The way I personally do it, which I think is the best, is through GitHub. What you would do then is you have your laptop, which is running a local server, and that's where you do all your experimentation and you develop the site, and then you git push, send that to GitHub, where you have a nice backup of it, and you have your versioning, and then when you're ready to publish something and everything's corrected and all the code works, you log into your server where you've installed Git and you just do a Git pull, bring down the version that you want to share with the public. So I think that gives you the most security. You can test things out locally, publish them when you're ready, and then you're not doing any development or experimentation on the server. Really all you have to do is the Git pull. It's a nice clean way of doing it. So a few other concerns with hosting your own site. How many people here are using Windows? Okay, and Mac for the rest of you guys? Okay. Any Linux people? Oh, I'm sorry, I see that. If you're developing a server on Windows, Windows is not case sensitive. So what that means is that Windows basically thinks this and this are the same file. If you misspell it, it might accept it anyway. The problem 
is that when you're then deploying this to a Linux server, Linux is case sensitive. So it thinks that these two files are different and it will give you like image not found. So you have to be very careful about that if you're developing on Windows, that it's not case sensitive. Another thing is server migration. Uh, earlier this summer, I moved from an apartment to a house elsewhere. So I had to physically move the server. And that ended up being a pretty difficult process. For one thing, I had to disconnect the server for a time, so there was an outage for my customers. Another problem is I had to switch over to a completely new internet service provider, so I had to go through all this new process, new static IP, um, point the domain name somewhere else. Um, if you're going to be physically moving your server, I recommend planning ahead as early as possible. If you could even set up a second server and have one going at your location A and be setting up a second one at location B, that would be best because then all you have to do is um, point the domain name to the new IP address. If you could do it, and of course, if you're hosting on GitHub, it's much easier. You just have to pull down all your content to the new server. So server migration is worth planning ahead on. The other thing is that ISPs are really reluctant to help you with all this. They think that anybody who would be hosting at their home must be a spammer. You must be up to something really sketchy if you're going to self-host. Don't be surprised if it's difficult and you have to call different people. Uh, with uh, CenturyLink, which was my initial ISP, they didn't know what a static IP address was. I had to call back a couple times to find the right person. Access on a local network. Computers have two IP addresses. So there's a local IP address uh, within your local Wi-Fi network, and then there'll be one for people accessing from outside the network. One that would be on your network could be something like uh, uh, 10.0.0.4. The problem with that, if you're developing your site on your local network, your domain name won't work. You'll type in uh, nantucketebooks.com and it won't go anywhere. You'll have to type in the local IP address which you'd find in your router's gateway. Uh, so just something to be aware of. A way around that you could use your phone as a hotspot. Uh, you can also use a VPN because that's going through an outside network and then you can go back in. Uh, so those are different ways that you want to test it out. And good to be aware of this because you'll want to test out your site on a lot of different platforms. Make sure it's mobile responsive and all that. Can I self-host email? Uh, you absolutely can go through the process of setting up your own email server. I would personally advise against it. As old as email is, it's still really complicated to set up. And more than it just being complicated, uh, the problem with self-hosting email is that there's a pretty high consequence for failure. If you mess one part of it up, you, you really expose yourself to a lot of different um, attacks. It's a way that people can get into your server. If you don't set it up right, spammers can send their spam through your server. So they'll send it to your server, and then your server sends it to the intended party. And that can get you blacklisted as a spammer. One day you could be sending an email to someone, and like, why doesn't anyone get my email? It's ending up in everyone's spam folder, because the ISP has branded you as a spammer, and not to be trusted. So. Those are some of the things that can happen when you're self-hosting email. It can be pretty risky. I've gone through most of the process in it, uh, but in the end, I, I would say this is an instance where there's other platforms. ProtonMail is one I recommend uh, that can do email for you. And all that's really involved then is pointing your domain name for email to the, to the email host. And there's instructions for that with your domain name provider. So when it comes to self-hosting email, I would say, don't do it. One thing that you could do, though, that I think is pretty cool is you can self-host an IRC server. So IRC is Internet Relay Chat. Back in the 90s, it's what people called a chat room. It's very easy to set up on your own server. I've done it a few times at this point. And you can do it entirely with free and open source software. If you're working with a development team, Rather than using Slack or Discord, just set up an IRC server. And you can have it password protected and use in, 
its own version of encryption. Essentially, Slack and Discord are IRC at their core, but then they put a bunch of stuff on top of that that harvests your personal information. So that's all I have for now. I thank you very much for your time, and uh, if you guys have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, I've gone through a little bit of that, but uh, yeah, that would be a dynamic system where you're sending information to the server, the server has to resolve, make sure it's a consistent experience for both people. Um, it's something you can do on a small scale, certainly. Um, if I, uh, there was a cool one I saw called Radio Wars that was just very basic and it was just HTML radio buttons. Uh, so I thought that was pretty neat. Um, that's definitely something you can do, but again, you just have to make sure that your, the information of the users is secure. Well, for example, the, we could look up the specs of the Raspberry Pi, which are pretty minimal. I'd say it's about the same as a top-end computer from 10 to 15 years ago. Uh, maybe two to four gigs of RAM would be plenty. Um, if you're just starting out, if you just want to try, if you just want to go through the process, you don't need a lot. Um, one of the big challenges that companies are, have been facing for the past decade or more is the scaling of these things. You can set up your own server, start a website in your dorm room on a laptop, but then when you've got 10,000 people, you've got 10,000 connections coming through the internet of the dorm going into your computer. That's a lot to handle. And so scaling that um, can be quite a challenge. Uh, there are definitely servers you can purchase online that are dedicated to that, that are, the whole rack mount thing. And, um, yeah, the, the, the challenge of scaling um, a site uh, with the kind of exponential growth that a certain size can have, that is a challenge. But if you're just starting off, I'd say a Raspberry Pi, you can just go down to Micro Center on 225, and they've got, they sell them, I know. Uh, that's what I would recommend starting off with. And if you really just want to start off, just have the server environment running on your local thing, if you don't want to have anyone connecting to it quite yet.